like to uh, welcome our first uh, guest speaker, and today uh, that is Kathy Russell. Uh, Kathy is a fluvial geomorphologist, and her research interests include the sediment supply and transport regime of urban streams, sediment pollution produced by construction areas, prediction of stream channel adjustment to urban conditions, and the provision of freedom space for urban streams to exhibit healthy dynamic behaviour to engage their floodplains. Thanks, Cathy, for being with us today. And Cathy will be joining us a little later um, for the panel session. Uh, yeah, and thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here as part of a interstate panel and talking to an interstate audience. Um, so hopefully we can get a bit more national cooperation um, and move the bar on this issue of construction, um, of dealing with sediments in urbanising and urban areas. So I'm from the University of Melbourne. I've been working on a research project over the last four years, looking at sediment supply from construction areas. And I've been working in collaboration with Melbourne Water um, on this project. Uh, and so I'm just gonna present some key findings from that today and what they mean for erosion and sediment control. So I have been um, focusing mainly on urban growth and greenfield construction and um, Pretty much all of Australia's cities and larger towns are expanding into new areas. Uh, for example, Adelaide needs about 10,000 new homes per year over the next 30 years. Victoria needs about 80,000 new homes per year over the next 10 years. There's, there's a push for infill and it is happening, uh, but there's still demand for greenfield development as well. Um, and it re represents a really dramatic change to the land surface when it's taken from um, rural land cover through to urban land cover and all of the stages in between um, with really dramatic changes to runoff and sediment production. Um, and while my, my work is mainly based on greenfield construction, the lessons uh, also apply to sediment control on infill development. We can see in any um, urbanizing or construction area that there are a huge diversity of potential sediment sources um, from complete vegetation removal, earth moving, exposure of soils, exposure of subsoils during the early phases through to um, import of materials and stockpiling of materials and tr uh, increased traffic, uh, heavy vehicle traffic um, on individual building sites. And, uh, and we also can see directly often um, sediment impacting on waterways and sediment um, control measures either being um, not being well designed or well maintained um, or being overwhelmed by the amounts of sediment. And that pollution coming from urbanizing areas um, has the potential to affect streams, wetlands, lakes, estuaries and bays or any aquatic env environments that are receiving that pollution. And these are environments that we all value and we know we need to protect them. Those impacts can be physical, for example, light attenuation into the water column, uh, clogging fish gills or other animal organism parts, um, smothering habitat and smothering um, substrates, or and they can be chemical. So um, there are uh, pollutants that are particularly associated with sediments um, that can then accumulate and impact aquatic environments downstream. We've been collaborating with Claudette Keller, Vin Pettigrove and others from RMIT who um, alongside our studies on sediment supply from um, construction areas, they've been looking at the pollutants that are associated with those sediments, um, including metals, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides and nutrients. And um, in urban environments um, or in urbanizing environments, you can have, um, you can have, because we're, we're moving from the, um, from a rural landscape to an urban landscape, you can have remobilization and disturbance of agricultural chemicals, um, which are then released into the environment or, um, and we also have application of new chemicals that are associated with the building process. And a really good example of this um, is bifenthrin, which is applied as a termite control agent really widely in, um, in termite prone areas during construction. Um, it is highly toxic to um, invertebrates, 
non-toxic to mammals um, and very persistent in the environment and very associated with sediment because it's um, hydrophobic. Now we've known for a long time that um, urban construction produces a significant spike in sediment supply. So this is um, one of the foundational models in this area from 1967, um, which shows the uh, transition um, and the, the change in sediment supply from a landscape going from um, agricultural land use through a construction phase and into urban land use. And, um, and that really significant peak and, and short-lived peak of sediment supply with the construction phase. So um, a few years ago, I updated that model. So um, I gathered all of the, um, the literature and evidence that and um, monitoring that had been done in different places around the world over the last 50 years or so and, um, and validated that model. And I, I found that it's still, in light of all of the evidence, it still held really well. And I was able to put some um, clearer numbers around um, sediment supply at those different phases um, and found that the sediment yield from active construction areas can be around 20 to 12,000 times higher than background rates. So even if your construction only covers a small proportion of the land surface, it could provide a significant part of your sediment budget. The papers that I'm referring to here are, are open access as well. So I'll put a link in the chat after, I'm, um, after I've finished so that you can access them. Um, what I wanted to do next was to zoom in on that spike. So um, rather than just seeing it as like a really short point in time, actually pulling that apart a bit and seeing how that process happened over time and what different um, degradation processes were happening during that construction phase. So um, I looked at construction patterns over time um, from aerial imagery across six growth areas in outer Melbourne. And I quantified the changing land cover and construction activities over time. And from that, I was able to infer the implications for runoff and potential sediment supply. From those six areas, I found really consistent patterns and timeframes of construction. So uh, in all of them, I found that bare soil cover peaked at or near 100% um, during the bulk earthworks phase. So um, it seems like not much vegetation was being retained on site and not much of the original soil profile was being retained. Um, so really complete um, disturbance of the soil. And then after that bulk earthworks phase, we start to get um, increasing impervious cover and connection to stormwater drainage. Um, and that happens really early in the process. So alongside high levels of bare soil exposure, you have um, increasing runoff and increasing connectivity into rivers and receiving waters. So um, we developed this conceptual model of sediment, potential sediment generation over the um, construction life cycle. Um, and this is the situation without any erosion and sediment control. So um, it kind of shows in, in the absence of any controls, what is the most, what are the most important stages um, for sediment risk? Um, and we recognize these five um, construction phases. So um, site preparation, which was pretty consistent that even before bulk earthworks, we were starting to see increased vehicle traffic and stockpiling on sites. Um, then the bulk earthworks phase where we had maximal soil dis disturbance, um, a lot of soil moving, um, removal of vegetation. Then the road and drain construction phase where we had increased um, imperviousness and connectivity. And then through to the lot scale house construction and landscaping phase before it moved into a mature urban landscape. And so um, the potential sediment supply from each of those phases uh, is linked to the intensity, but also strongly linked to its duration. So um, limiting the construction stage size or the duration that, um, that it's in each of those phases is important. Um, we found that typically the, um, the road and drain construction phase had the potential to produce the most sediment because it was a little bit longer lived than that bulk earthworks phase. 
Um, and the house construction phase was also really important because it typically lasted for more than a year. We also compared the potential um, sediment supply over that transitional construction phase to um, what could be produced over um, from a mature urban area from values from the literature. And we found that um, the total sediment supply potential um, over the construction phase could be, um, it would typically take around 50 years of mature urban land use for the cumulative, cumulative load to surpass what's supplied in the construction phase. And again, that's a potential load if we don't apply any wasud or erosion sediment control measures. And so what that's telling us is that erosion and sediment control for construction should be considered with just as much weight as wasud for mature urban areas. Now, I've just recently um, got some data which um, helps to validate this model. This is from um, a PhD student here at the university, Paolo Silva. Um, and he has been uh, monitoring street scale urbanizing um, catchments with active construction um, at different stages of the development cycle. And what he's found is that, um, it, so he's confirmed that um, the sediment supply from early stages of, of development where there is um, bulk earthworks and road and drain construction still going on in those catchments are producing very high concentrations of suspended sediment in runoff. Um, and then um, those concentrations decline in the, um, the catchments which have house construction and landscaping, um, and they're reasonably low in the mature urban catchment. We've also been looking at sediment supply at the catchment scale. So um, this is also in Officer in Victoria. Um, and so we've been doing some sediment load monitoring on two creeks in Officer. Each of these creeks, we have a station upstream um, and downstream of the urbanizing area so that we can isolate the urban catchment inputs. And we're, do, we're um, taking suspended sediment samples and um, flow measurements at each of those stations. Um, it's a lot of data from this study, but um, I just wanted to mention a couple of key findings, which are, I think are quite interesting. One is that the downstream sediment concentrations tend to be one to two orders of magnitude lower than those street scale concentrations um, that Paolo is finding at his monitoring sites. And so um, there's, there's some dilution uh, from non-urban parts of the catchment, but there's also probably uh, quite a lot of sediment attenuation and capture between the streetscape and the streams. Um, this is a mixed urbanizing catchment. It still has a lot of non-urbanized um, elements in the landscape. It also has purpose-built sediment ponds, wetlands. It has natural floodplains. It's quite a low gradient area. So um, there's, there's potentially quite a lot of, um, of areas where sediment could, could accumulate. Um, and the long-term fate of that captured sediment is unknown. Um, but there's a potential that it will um, remobilize as runoff increases more and more, or as the drainage corridors are altered. So if they're landscaped or if the channels are reconfigured to be more efficient um, or with construction of um, water sensitive urban design assets in the corridor. Um, and our, our monitoring showed really highly variable sediment loads, but we did see some evidence that um, sediment loads increased when we saw direct works on the channel um, or in the floodplains with, um, with vegetation removal. So there could be potentially a long legacy of sediment pollution, um, and it's going to need ongoing control through the development process. Um, and this long term of capture of high levels of sediment um, in our natural floodplains and waterways is not sustainable because um, it comes with pollutant buildup and physical accretion, um, accretion of sediments. Um, and it's not really maintainable without um, damage to those ecosystems. 
a final point from that catchment scale study was that the we did see increased sediment loads downstream of urbanizing areas, but they were driven primarily by increased runoff. So um, it seemed like there was plenty of sediment available to be moved. Um, and as the runoff increased with, uh, with imperviousness, it was, it was just delivering more and more sediment. It's just another reason why um, controlling the quantity of stormwater runoff um, and trying to um, evaporate, transpire, infiltrate as much stormwater as possible through water sensitive urban design is really important through the construction stage and beyond. On the pollutants um, with the RMIT work, um, our collaborators found that um, there were more pesticides detected downstream of the urban development than upstream. And bifenthrin, which was a um, pollutant they were particularly focusing on, is potentially toxic to invertebrates one year post-construction at some sites. Um, and this, again, is a pollutant that's strongly associated with sediment that's routinely applied in house construction in this area, and that's then disturbed during landscaping when the soil is disturbed. So the, um, for these kinds of pollutants, the house construction and landscaping phases and sediment release from those phases is really important. All right. Um, so um, I'm just, um, I'll wrap up with some implications for erosion and sediment control from this work. Um, we've shown that there's high sediment supply potential during active construction, which can be one to four orders of magnitude higher than background rates. So erosion and sediment control needs to be highly efficient to prevent a large sediment pulse. Um, erosion and sediment control are important at all stages of construction. Um, in the early stages, we have an erosion peak and in the late stages, we have a pollutant peak. Um, and we also know that the, the duration of each of those phases is really important in controlling um, total sediment supply potential. So soil stabilization and um, maintaining soil cover is key. Um, and thinking about staging planning, um, limiting stage sizes and limiting um, the time that each stage is active can really help there. I suppose that it's worth mentioning that um, Sediment liberation is a really um, quite a stochastic or a random, not random, but um, it's a process that's driven by highly variable processes. So if you happen to just have a, a really big storm that coincides with maximum um, soil exposure, um, then you're going to get a really big sediment pulse. And so if you can limit the amount of time that that soil is exposed, then you're limiting the risk that it'll coincide with a big storm. Um, and um, we've found that erosion and sediment control for greenfield construction is just as important as water sensitive urban design for mature urban areas. Taking a bit more of a catchment scale perspective, we've found that um, stormwater volume reduction is really important to reduce sediment delivery um, and remobilization through the construction period and beyond. And um, maintaining functioning waterway corridors, for example, our natural floodplains and wetlands and streams is really important. Um, they play an important role in, um, in capturing sediment under natural conditions, but we don't wanna rely on them to mop up uh, increased rates of sediment and pollution. Uh, and we need to take extra care when constructing or landscaping close to waterways. Um, and I haven't really touched on this um, in my work, but I think it's important to mention that we need to consider the catchment context and, and other key risk factors. Um, for example, the soil type, the slope, um, what, how sensitive the, the receiving waters are. Um, and so um, if we have highly erodible soils like um, dispersive or sodic soils. We have construction on higher slope sites. Um, and if we have, uh, if we have um, construction which, can, which is well connected to sensitive environments, then um, we might need to prioritize 
erosion and sediment control a bit higher. That is all I have, so thank you. I did want to just mention that um, the 11th Australian Stream Management Conference is being held in South Australia um, this year, and so I'd encourage anyone who's interested in stream management from any angle to, um, to submit an abstract or come along to that. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Cathy. I think um, we can all agree that that research sets some real or provides some really good um, background and, and great numbers that we can sort of uh, look at from more of a, um, a, quali a qualitative, quantitative fashion. And um, we've had a few questions um, on on the Q and A um, about your presentation. Just probably wanted to raise um, one with you. So the questions are around um, how we can apply or if we can apply this research to other locations. I mean, there's obviously climatic differences between the impacts of the, the stormwater or stormwater pollution, but the generation models, they can be applied um, regardless of which development you, you're looking at. I think that the general patterns of sediment availability are going to be similar. Um, the seasonality of the um, and, and the intensity of rainfall is going to differ between different climate climate zones. Um, and so understanding your staging and which time of times of year are the riskiest, um, it's really important to know um, your local climate. Um, but um, yeah, the model of, of potential sediment generation um, should be quite applicable across different areas. Lovely, because there was a few more questions about where the where other research um, on this particular topic may have been conducted. For instance, so specific yeah. um, other development sites around Australia. So people are asking, or oh, you know, is anybody <laughs> um, doing this research at this location or that location? But potentially they can apply the same um, models and and consider that regardless. Like I said, apart from your maybe yeah. your climate. Yeah, potentially. Um, I, I don't know anyone who's working on this problem in South Australia, but um, I would love to be connected with anyone that is, if anyone knows. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Cathy. So if anybody out there on um, our Q&A line has got links to what's going on in South Australia or would like um, some more uh, detail from Cathy on this topic, um, they can get in touch with her. But we will be having um, a panel session later today. So um, get get your uh, questions prepared for that. Lovely. Thank you so much, Kathy.